This week on The Book Drop, we chat with our first guest about the joys and struggles of creating virtual story times. The group shares where to find free reading material online, and we get all heart eye emoji about our favorite fictional pairs for our query of the week. This is The Book Drop. Welcome to The Book Drop. I'm Erin Dewar, the Readers and Writers Librarian for Oma Public Library, and this episode is about ways to read for free using just the internet. So we're talking about things like the OPL digital collections, books in the public domain, but also what's out there for those parents and kids that are now homeschooling and missing those regular weekly story times. I'm talking with two staff members from Omaha Public Library's Youth Services team. I'm going to have them introduce themselves. So welcome, friends. Tell listeners who you are, what you do for the library, and what branch you are regularly found at. Hi, I'm Ms. Katya. I am a Youth Service Specialist, and I'm at the Millard Branch. Hi, I'm Ms. Cassie. I'm a Youth Services Specialist at the Elkhorn Branch. If you were at your branches, what does your work normally look like? Maybe like on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, what kind of programs or what are you doing for patrons? Yeah, at the Miller branch, I would be doing story times, family story times and baby story times, um, working on collection development. So making sure all our books are beautiful and ready for people to check out. I also work with our volunteers, so all those high schoolers that come in looking for hours. <laughs> I miss them the most. <laughs> I would also be doing my story times at the branch. Also, since it's April, we'd be looking at contacting the schools right now to be setting up those school visits so we could talk and promote the summer reading program. That's one of those things that also we're adapting and trying to figure out right now. Tell me, what are you working on now? So we're working on <laughs> story times. So some of those should be on our YouTube channel now. Um, I know that Cassie's working on Every Child Ready to Read. Getting your child ready to read tips for families. Lots of videotaping of ourselves. Right. <laughs> Lots of bloopers. <laughs> and I want to talk about bloopers in a minute. I think if you've never worked in a library, people maybe don't understand what all goes into creating a story time. So can you talk a little bit about what like preparation for even a regular story time looks like and what goes into creating video content? So planning a story time, picking a theme is the first part. Usually we try to go seasonal, things that are, or even current events or something that might be happening, you know, St. Patrick's Day, springtime, things like that coming up. So researching and looking that up, then you spend a lot of time calling in books because I like to try and find something new. And then we also are finding another added educational element of a song or a rhyme or finger play. And then that would be something also that we could get up and move. So we're just expanding those concepts through learning different skills that way. And then for me as a newer member working family story times in the youth department is learning all the different songs and memorizing all the different rhymes that the kids already know or the parents already know. So you're trying to lead them in these songs and rhymes, but they're already ahead of you or <laughs> trying to learn all the new things or trying to find all the new stuff, like going through YouTube and, and finding new fun things that go with your themes. Like I like to do colors a lot. There are five different areas um, that parents can be working on for their kids under the age of five. And we are making tips that you can be doing. We incorporate these ideas already into our story times usually. They're just ideas and concepts parents and families can do at home with their little one to help expand their skills and get them ready to become readers. So it's not for children that are readers yet. The kids that are at home, we're just learning skills, learning things like how to sound out letters, learning things about letters, learning how letters are shaped and everything like that. Talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing are the five that we're working on um, for the tips. And also when we're creating a story time, we want to try and hit each of those. So you guys mentioned bloopers earlier. <laughs> Cassie, you talked about, you started a little hashtag, right? Yeah. OPL bloopers. I felt like, oh, well, like my first day filming, I think I had 36 clips that were not postable. They were not done. And then at the end of the day, I realized I had been saying the author's name wrong. So everything I had done was trash. 
and not usable. And so that's when I posted the blooper because I was like, I am super discouraged. But you know what? This is something really funny that happened. And maybe somebody will smile. If somebody thinks this is funny, maybe that makes this experience a little bit more worth it, like that it's having an impact. Because that's the point is that this brings a light and a joy and something to do to our families that are prepped at their homes. Right. Yeah. And it might not be all the families that have gotten to enjoy the bloopers, but my family has and I <laughs> right. know my friends have. And that's just a little bit more encouraging and uplifting. Have you gotten any other feedback from like parents or kids or any regular patrons? I had a lot of good feedback, family that have been sharing it, that have gotten to see it. And I've had cousins sharing it. So that's kind of cool too, that we're reaching more people than just the Omaha families. But I know a lot of them have been like, thank you for this break and something funny. And I've gotten videos of the kids doing the actions to Slippery <laughs> Fish and yelling at the TV about the hiccups for the penguin has the hiccups book. What I found that I loved the most about this is that my nephew is autistic, so my sister is always concerned about taking him into big groups. So he was able to watch a story time with me in it. And he was dancing along and he was saying hello to me. And, mm -hmm. and that was a wonderful video to see. Or I have a friend who has three kids under three. And so she's like, I don't know if I can handle a story time in a library. So they were able to go to story time and they're learning like dances and finger plays. And she can get a better example of like what would happen if she were to take them in. And so those are some of my like favorite little videos. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. Those that's like really great connections that you're making that some of those you're right, like we haven't been able to make them when you're just in the branches. So I think this has shown us a little bit what other ways we can connect with people and patrons, which I think is super cool. I'm so glad I got to chat with you two today. So for our listeners, you can find those online story times and helping your child be ready to read quick tips on the Oma Public Library YouTube channel and look out for more OPL bloopers on our social media. Thank you, Cassie and Katia, for being our very first guest on the book drop. We'll see you All again right. someday. Bye. 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 Someday. <laughs> our group discussion is up next. Hello, friends. We made it to our second week, which I think is super exciting. Let's all start by introducing ourselves. So tell listeners who you are, what you do for the library, and which branch you are typically found at. Hi, I'm Michelle Carlson, the book club librarian, and I am found at the Willa Cather branch. Uh, my name is David Dick. I am a specialist. I do reference and reader's advisory, uh, usually at the Abrahams branch. Hi, everybody. I'm Ellie Roberts. I also work at the Abrahams branch, but I focus more on kids. Hi, my name is Anna Wilcoxon. I am the Diversity and Inclusion Librarian for OPL, and I am typically at the South Omaha branch. And I'm Erin Dewar. I'm the Readers and Writers Librarian, and you usually find me at the main library downtown, also known as the W. Dale Clark Library. So last week, a couple of us talked a bit about the possibility of running out of library books or having limited access to materials while we're mostly all stuck in our houses. So this week, we wanted to explore where you can find free reading material on the internet. So we've broken this down into different areas, which we'll each talk about. And I'm excited about this conversation because we are going to, a couple of you are going to talk about things that are beyond just regular ebooks and e-audiobooks. So Anna, let's start with you. Yes, so um, I'm going to talk about the digital resources you can find at Omaha Public Library. We could not do this podcast today and not mention what we have to offer. So we have thousands of ebooks available through a service called Libby. Um, to access this kind of content, you would go to omahalibrary.org. Near the top of the screen, there's a tab that's labeled Explore. And once you click on that, you'll see all of the different formats that are available to you to explore, <laughs> I guess. So you can choose to download ebooks in multiple different formats. If you have a, a specific device, like a Kindle, you could download your book in that specific format. If you do not have a specific e-reader, you can download items into your desktop or as a PDF. So it's really easy to get the ebooks in a lot of different forms. As far as the content of the ebooks, we have a lot of fiction, a lot of nonfiction, everything from cookbooks, memoirs, kind of any kind of book you would expect to find in the regular print library, you should, you'll find something in our ebook collection. The nice thing about ebooks is that there are no late fees. They magically disappear from your account after two weeks. 
You can have 10 of them at a time. You can also um, download audiobooks from the website too. They're in MP3 format. So if you are a listener of books, there are some digital options for you there as well. If you happen to be using any of these services and get stuck with technology or just how they work in general, has, there's a really great help section available on the website. And there's also an online chat reference service called Ask OPL that you can access from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday to get live chat help from a librarian. We also have a digital magazine collection called Flipster. So this is also a really fun way to um, stay up to date with what's going on. There's everything from Rolling Stone, Vogue, Us Weekly, People, Crafty Magazines, Bon Appetit, and you can download these right into your browser to read as well. And they also have a nice selection of back issues. So there's quite a bit of really nice free digital content available through the library. You just need your library card to access it all. Those are kind of the basic OPL digital resource breakdown. Ellie, I think you had some other you want to be able to talk about that you can access from resources that are not Omaha Public Library. Yeah, absolutely. So I am going to talk a little bit about Project Gutenberg, which is a website that hosts over 60,000 free ebooks in a ton of formats. Um, they have Kindle, downloadable ebooks, and plain HTML, which means you can just open it on a web browser. You don't have to download it. Um, these are free to download and you can keep them forever. You don't have to make an account or sign up for anything from their website, and their titles are searchable and browsable, um, and the project is accessible at www.gutenberg.org. And fun fact, it is named for Johannes Gutenberg, who was responsible for creating the world's first printing press. Um, if you don't know, this invention made books much cheaper and thus much more accessible than the handwritten manuscripts, which were what books had to come in um, in the time before the printing press. So Project Gutenberg can provide all of these books because of public domain, which in the US refers to creative works whose exclusive intellectual property rights have expired, which happens automatically 95 years after publication. Um, that does mean a lot of what's available on Project Gutenberg is from 1925 or earlier. But what does all of that like legalese mean for our dear listeners? Um, it means that right now you can read Little Women for free. So if you saw the movie or you want to see the movie, you can read the original um, source material. Or you can w read Frankenstein or some Charles Dickens and H.G. Wells. Um, one of my personal favorite books, which is The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, is available. And so is The Turning of the Screw by Henry James, which, if you liked The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix, is the basis for their next series. They've got a ton of Edgar Allan Poe's short stories, and they also have nonfiction as well. Um, I think that Ida B. Wells's Southern Horror Lynch Law in All Its Phases is an excellent work of historical nonfiction that I would absolutely recommend to anyone living in the U.S. if you're looking for a place to start. Um, a few features I love if you are kind of overwhelmed by all of this um, are their lists of their most popular titles of all time, and also um, they have a list of their most downloaded books from the previous day, which if you're kind of a data nerd like me, then it's a cool little feature to see what everybody else is reading. Um, personally, I'm not usually much for older books, but part of the magic of Project Gutenberg is that they have content from all over the world and lesser known titles by well-known authors. Do you guys have any favorite authors or books um, from 1925 or earlier? I was able to think of one, one actually, uh, The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. I loved that book. I read it a very long time ago, but it was published. I looked it up when you were, we were talking about this podcast and it was published mm -hmm. in 1888. So that should be available on there. And that's a beautiful, epic book. That is, that is a good book. Uh, it has my favorite single chapter in any book ever, which is The Grand Inquisitor. Mm -hmm. cool. Classic. David, I noticed some, um, I think some Philip K. Dick was on there, which I don't think is necessarily like the right window, but he might have had like an exception to public domain mm -hmm. um, that he allowed things to be um, published for the public earlier. That, you know, that's really very, like that very much something he would do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know um, what their most downloaded or what their most checked out item is. Do you remember mm -hmm. on their like, most ever list? Ooh, I think I'm gonna have to check. I'll check while um, somebody else okay. is talking about okay. a resource. I also, um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's like a data thing for me. It's more of like a, 
a creep and I want to know what, <laughs> what's the most like interest or what's the thing that everybody wants to look at, I think is cool. Yeah, absolutely. I love that they have that like social data compiling mm-hmm. um, component. It's just cool to, um, you know, kind of feel like you're in a community of readers, like I said mm-hmm. last week. Cool. What about some resources for folks who are having a hard time with reading and maybe want like audio or visual content? We've been pretty like ebook heavy in the conversation so far. So the fun topic I got to research was all about celebrities reading stories. Uh, Celebrities reading books out loud is not a new trend, but the popularity sure did soar during this time of stay at home and social distancing orders. There is just such a delight in sharing our favorite stories in books uh, that help eclipse the stress and fear of the time. So first off, we have Save With Stories, a program launched by actors Jennifer Garner and Amy Adams. Across the country, schools shut down due to the coronavirus pandemic, but millions of children go to school not just to learn, but for their meals. So in partnership with Save the Children and No Kid Hungry, Save With Stories features various celebrities. We got actors, musical artists, athletes, all of the above, (laughs) reading picture books on Instagram and Facebook to provide fun and education to kids and parents. And honestly, anyone, I've enjoyed listening to them myself uh, while everybody is stuck at home. Each post does include a prompt to consider a donation to the organizations. And I hope everybody is familiar with uh, my favorite book talker, LeVar Burton, uh, has been reading short stories aloud for his podcast, LeVar Burton Reads, since 2017. Uh, Everybody might know Mr. Burton from Roots, Reading Rainbow, or Star Trek. In every podcast episode, LeVar invites us to take a break from daily life by taking a deep breath and we dive into a great story. His narration blends with these gorgeous soundscapes to bring stories to life. One of my favorite quotes from LeVar is on his website, and it reads, I've dedicated my life to the power of storytelling. Whether I'm acting, directing, writing, or podcasting, I believe sharing stories is what I was born to do because storytelling is what brings us all together. It's just so lovely. And that is what he is trying to do also in this pandemic. Uh, LeVar has invited everyone to join him for live readings on Twitter. What I really appreciate about his version of these stories is that he's reading children's books, teen and adult. So there's content for everybody. So you can enjoy the lovely diversion from everything uh, as by yourself or as a family. Uh, the schedule is available on his website, lavarburton.com. And I think David had some other <laughs> experimental type stories for us to learn about. Well, I'm going to get postmodern here and talk about experimental storytelling. The internet, you know, has great potential for the form stories can take. So you can see some of the really weird things creative people have done. Uh, one is uh, 17776. It's a story about what uh, f- sports would look like without physical limitations. It's a kind of speculative science fiction story about two space probes watching uh, immortal humans play a different version of football. It's told via text, GIFs, and videos. It's written by uh, John Boyce, uh, Boyce, sorry, via Vox's SB Nation. Uh, as you know, a lot of great post-modern uh, writers have had backgrounds in sports journalism too, like uh, Hunter S. Thompson and uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Also, there's uh, Welcome to Night Vale, which is a surreal horror podcast that presents itself as local news for a small desert town where conspiracy theories are true. The narrative unfolds slowly, focuses on building a creepy atmosphere. We also have a... Uh, ebook spinoff of uh, one of the creators, uh, Joseph Fink, that tells some of the story of it. And then there's uh, Homestuck, which is a webcomic by Andrew uh, Hussey that utilizes GIFs, uh, flash animation, and instant message logs, uh, along with like regular still comics image. It tells a story of a group of teenagers who accidentally usher in the apocalypse via a video game. Another thing I wanted to talk about that's a little different from experimental storytelling is there's been a phenomena recently called actual play, where It's people playing role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, Vampire the Masquerade, and Apocalypse World. And it's a form of collaborative storytelling that comes across kind of like a mixture between improv and radio drama. A few highlights for me are The Adventure Zone, which is created by the McElroy brothers, who are best known for the My Brother, My Brother and Me comedy advice podcast. And they record it along with their dad, get together and play D&D. Another one, a really famous one, is Critical Role. It's a uh, long-running D&D campaign where... All the players are professional voice actors, including uh, Matt Mercer, 
last one I want to mention here is a personal favorite of mine. If you're interested in the format but not interested in high fantasy, it's called Critical Bits. It's a teenage superhero story along the lines of like Teen Titans, The New Mutants, or Runaways. So yeah, mine are pretty niche. So some people might not be interested in that. But uh, Aaron, what can people do to find the genres of their choice for reading online? Yeah, I also want to give a shout out to the first one you mentioned, like 17776. It's on a sports website. I don't care about sport. It is just one of the most fascinating, like wonderful, like beautiful reading experiences of my life. And when I read it a few years ago, when it came out, it's hard to describe what it is. I think I cried and it like involves things like football being played by like tornadoes and satellites talking to each other. And it's just so beautiful. And I think John Boyce has done some other stuff recently, but nothing quite at that level. Even like, if you think it's not for you, it might be for you just because it's so different. It'll give you like such a totally different experience. Maybe that's like too intense for you. So I went in search of what you can find specifically for genre readers. But with that said, the first site I'm going to talk about is not actually specific to one genre, and that is manybooks.net. But it is very easy to browse and search if you want to like find something specific. So their site has 50,000 free eBooks, and many of those are in the public domain. Some of them are coming from Project Gutenberg, like Ellie talked about. But it's also grown to be a platform that self-publishers use to like introduce and share their work. So you're getting like original content there. And the site's really nice looking, which is important to me a lot of times that it's like easy to use and to access all this, the content on it, you can either read it straight in the browser or download it to your device and they offer like multiple different file formats. So that's good. Next thing I want to talk about is for science fiction and fantasy readers. And that is Tor, which if you regularly read science fiction and fantasy, you probably know that name because they have a print publishing arm. But I want to focus on Tor.com, which is T-O-R.com. And it's an online magazine and community site that covers science fiction, fantasy, and like related topics. So, and on their site, they publish short, like original fiction in related commentary aimed to explore, encourage, and enable interesting and rewarding conversations with and between readers, which I just thought was like a really nice sentiment. From their homepage, you can directly access their like free short fiction. It's just right there at the top. But they also have an e-book club. So you can join and they will email you. I think it's about once a month. It's, they'll email you access to a full uh, free book from like big name authors. So like the latest title was The Collapsing Empire by John Scalzi. If you just even Google like Tor e-book club, I went straight to it. It was kind of the easier way to find that site. And I want to talk about romance. Even if you don't read romance, you know that Harlequin is synonymous with romance fiction. And so from their homepage, which is just harlequin.com, you can look for online reads, which is the access to their free content. And what they're doing is serializing stories by Harlequin authors. Each week, there'll be like a new chapter. But you can filter and like, which I thought was super cute. So you can filter it by time limit, which I thought was very helpful, but they also have like a filter option that I want to be seduced or sit on the edge of my seat or fall in love or ride off into the sunset. And I just, it's a really nice, beautiful site, like easy to use. You do have to sign up for an account, which I thought was kind of a hoop at first, but it does ask for your birthday. And so I realized, I think it's probably more because it's romance. So some of that content is probably like steamy and adults. So they just kind of need to make sure that kids are not accessing stuff that they shouldn't be. There's like so much more out there, I feel like. So does anybody have anything else that they want to like shout out or what else you got? Yeah, I forgot about this until just now, but I've been watching the live readings that Omaha Lit Fest has been hosting. Oh. Um, so they do those, I believe, at six o'clock more or less daily, but definitely check their Facebook page to kind of verify that. And they have their um, authors have just like do different readings and they're really wonderful and wholesome. The authors always mention that it's like a nice connection to an audience for them, which is just such a sweet way to kind of socialize right now. You can ask them questions and I think they last usually about a half an hour is how long the ones that I've watched. And I also checked real quick to see what our um, top titles on Gutenberg are. Um, 
the ones the most downloaded from the day before and most popular overall have a lot of similarity so pride and prejudice is on both of those lists as is frankenstein and um, the works of edgar Allan poe but on the most downloaded list um the second title is hemp herds as paper making material and the third one is <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and the third one is A Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe. So that's oh. maybe some topical. Timely. Yeah. That's yeah. Funny. One of the top 10 ones is actually The Yellow Wallpaper by mm. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which is one of my favorite short stories. And I think also, even though it was kind of like about women's role um, and isolation, I think it might be another timely read. So um, definitely worth looking at those right now. I just remembered based off of something uh, you said in the last uh, recording, Ellie, was that, you know, people can read all kinds of things, including uh, fan fiction. And so I just wanted to point out that archive of our own, one of the better known fan fiction sites, uh, has actually won a Hugo. So yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. When Michelle was talking and also Ellie just like mentioning LitFest authors reading, like our children's staff have been also been doing like videos for story times mm -hmm. and literacy tips and I don't have kids. I just started watching them and I just love them. I rarely get to sit in on a story time since I'm not a youth services member and I, it's a different type of way of being read to. I listen to podcasts, but it's not the same thing. <laughs> but so I don't know, there's something like very calming. So when you're talking about celebrities reading, I think that too, like it's just a really nice experience for someone just to read you a story, even if it's just like a kid's picture book. So yeah, I, there are a bunch of other stuff out there. Like David, you mentioned fan fiction. So fanfiction.net is a place like where there's just like original stuff, self-publishing platforms. A lot of time there's authors out there offering like their free content on like Wattpad or Smashwords that you can access. I think it's important to remember that like just because it's free or just because it's self-published doesn't have anything to do with quality or content. There are huge books from the last, you know, 10 years that started as just an ebook that someone was self-publishing on the internet and then became like a huge, big million, million dollar title, right? You just never know. Like there's all kinds of stuff out there, but also there's just maybe some like really good gems out there. One book that ended up becoming, you know, started out as serialized thing on a uh, website was John Dies at the End by David Wong. It started out as just kind of a serialized thing on cracks.com and then eventually became a big, really thick uh, kind of splatter comedy horror novel. Right. And also a movie, right? Yeah. With yeah. Uh, Paul Giamatti. <laughs> Any other closing thoughts? There were a couple other um, resources that I didn't mention. Just uh, Dolly Parton, uh, who is one of America's icons, um, <laughs> she's always had a giving heart for literacy. I did not know, but in 1995, way back then, she launched Dolly Parton's Imagination Library, a book gifting program that mails free, high-quality books to children from birth until they be begin school, no matter what their family's income is. Dolly Parton's Imagination Library is uh, currently producing a 10-week read-aloud video series called Good Night with Dolly. So the book lady, aka Dolly herself, sits down to read books from the Imagination Library to children and families, focusing on comforting and reassuring children during these shelter in place mandates. Good night with Dolly launch at the beginning of April. She personally hopes that these videos will provide a welcome distraction during a time of unrest, but also inspire a love of reading and books in the hearts of the children who see them. I think that Dolly Parton is like our dream pie in the sky, never going to happen, like interview for this podcast. <laughs> yeah. All of our faces are like, <laughs> yeah. Dolly, if you're <laughs> listening, we love you. Yes. Got love our two. Dolly. <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> Ooh, Dolly's yeah. always, children's literacy is a thing mm -hmm. that she's cared about for a really long time. But I do like that, like a lot of these celebrities are like, the thing I'm going to do is read books when that's not their brand right or that they're mm -hmm. not even authors like everybody's just the thing I'm going to do during this this crisis is like sit down and read children's book to people which I just think is a like a beautiful message about literature and reading and what it does for us and how it brings us together and just the joy of it so that's mm -hmm. just kind of an awesome thing to see happen okay so 
Last week during Query of the Week, I mentioned that I was in a, a like months long binge of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel. So after our episode, we kind of spun out into a conversation about like their well known like romantic pairs, which led us to our Query of the Week, which is who is your favorite fictional pair? And we did kind of clarify that that you could be romantic, it could be friends, it could be siblings, it could be from any form of fiction. So I will start. I'm going to take more than my time. One, I really tried to get away from a romantic pair, but I just couldn't because I think like I'm a sap and that's like what I just connect with. <laughs> and this pair is very new and somewhat controversial, but I'm just going to defend them. And my pick is Fleabag and the Priest, also known by fans as Hot Priest from <laughs> the second season of Fleabag, which is a British comedy drama. This is why their relationship is very fleeting, but it ends, I think, in such a beautiful place. And if you don't watch the show, Fleabag, the main character, breaks the fourth wall and no one sees it except the priest is the only person who ever sees it, which I just thought was the most beautiful expression of like someone seeing your true self that the first time it happened, I gasped and mm. something is like super special, I think, about their relationship, even though people will have issues because yes, he is a priest, but he ends up in a really good place, I think, for himself personally. So sorry I took too much time, but that was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle. I love it. It's perfect. At least your explanation was. And I think a lot of people will be able to relate to that. So as you say, I had like a thousand more pairs jump into my brain. So I'm going to have to do two, but I will also do them really quickly. So I'm going to do a romantic TV. My favorite show of all time is 30 Rock. And so Liz Lemon and Chris Cross really captured my heart <laughs> in a lot of ways. You know, the whole show was kind of structured around this joke about women, specifically Liz, being able to have it all because she's this boss writer and, but then, you know, can't really get her personal relationship together. And then she finally meets Chris, who's this perfect weirdo balance to her. And I just think it's so beautiful how that relationship plays out in the last two seasons but literary um my one of my favorite book series is legend by marie lou and i think she is one of the best romantic action writers in the young adult world and potentially literary world in general but the characters of june and day are just so sweet in this almost romeo juliet relationship that they have but again it plays out throughout three books and it's just a really beautiful relationship I went with a uh, friendship pair because uh, being shut in this much, that's, you know, that, that's my wish fulfillment is friends again, because, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm here with my spouse. So, you know, I have the romance. I just need, I need the friendship. So I went with uh, <laughs> two, of, two of my favorite superheroes, which are uh, Nightcrawler and Wolverine from the X-Men, because it's the uh, happy-go-lucky, good-natured, uh, you know, philosopher priest guy and the uh, gruff, uh, Johnny Cash, Clint Eastwood-esque guy with uh, retractable claws. And just like the uh, the friendship that develops from that is just really kind of, kind of cool. It's like kind of a like opposites attract sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and if you do want it as a romantic pair, we did mention fan fiction. There's plenty of that out there. So. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> it's both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like Michelle, 30 Rock is one of my favorite television shows ever. And I chose Liz Lemon and Jack Donaghy for my favorite fictional pair. I love them like on their own as characters, mm -hmm. but I like together, I just like they're, you know, polar opposites, but they still find a way to be like best friends and push each other forward in some ways. I also love listening to them like jab each other. They insult each other in the best possible ways, but the core of it is love, I think. So yeah, those are the most charming fictional couple for me. So I, similarly to David, I feel like this is kind of a, like, of the moment uh, favorite fictional pair, but um, I was thinking about a book that I talked about for our book bash, which is called My Brother's Husband. It's a manga by Gengoro Tagame. I don't want to get too big into the description, but basically this Canadian Mike goes to meet his brother-in-law and his niece Kana um, in Japan and Mike and Kana just have such a like 
pure, sweet relationship. Kana's probably, like, about eight years old, and she's just really obsessed with this, like, big, burly, kind of, like, (laughs) out-of-his-element Canadian man. And I just love, I was trying to think of, like, a different take on platonic pairs, and I realized that, like, something I love about fictional characters is if they're, like, surprisingly good with kids and I think that that is really exemplified in this series also the series will make you blubber like a big baby if you are like me so I would definitely recommend that one awesome I feel like we could talk about that forever I have so many others that are in the back of my mind that I just don't be like but this one and this yeah Yeah, this is definitely yeah it's our next valentine's day episode for sure so that is our second episode. As Ellie said last week, don't return your books right now. <laughs> this is The Book Drop, and we will talk to you all next time. Thank you for joining us. We'd love to hear your answer for our next query of the week, which is who is your favorite monster? That monster can be from any form of fiction. Send your responses in a short audio clip or tweet length response to our new shiny email, which is the book drop at omahalibrary.org. The book drop is produced by Omaha Public Library. Our theme music is Trapped in Amber, courtesy of the band Lucid Fugue. Don't forget to follow the book drop on your favorite podcast app and like and follow Omaha Public Library on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll talk to you next time on the book drop. Bye.